Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian. Today's video, the North African Campaign, Part 2. On February 12, 1941, a 50-year-old renowned tank commander and veteran of the First World War stepped off of a German transport plane into the arid desert air. This man was none other than Erwin Rommel. Relatively short with a solemn look, he was the son and grandson of school teachers, and he looked the part or perhaps more like the principal. However, this man who would come to be called the Desert Fox was not just a scholar of infantry tactics, he was one of Germany's most well-respected battlefield tacticians. His image has been somewhat sanitized by both wartime and post-war propaganda, and so it is worth remembering that Rommel was one of Adolf Hitler's personal favorites. He was here on behalf of the Fuhrer to clean up Mussolini's mess. During our research for this episode, we found the full English translation of Erwin Rommel's 1937 military classic, Infantry Attacks, a treatise on World War I infantry tactics, thanks to today's sponsor, Scribd. Scribd is an online resource that allows you to access a huge library of books, audiobooks, magazines, and other reading material from almost any device. Follow our link in the description down below to support our channel and get a free 30-day trial with unlimited access to their digital library. With that said, onwards to Africa. Operation Compass, the codename for the first Allied military operation of the Western Desert Campaign, had been an enormous success for the British, thanks to General Sir Archibald Wavell and his subordinate Richard O'Connor. However, the Allies' winning streak was about to come to an end. On February 9th, Winston Churchill ordered the 6th Australian Division to cross the Mediterranean and join the Allied defense of Greece at nearly the same moment that Germany's newly created Africa Corps began deploying in Libya. Since the British did not expect a counterattack in Libya, most of the 7th Armored Division returned to Egypt to defend Her Majesty's holdings there. As a result, when Erwin Rommel arrived with 65,000 German troops, in addition to the 55,000 Italians already present, he was able to bring a 120,000 man hammer down on the dangerously strung out allies. In the entirety of the Middle East theater, Wavell had around 118,000 men under his command as part of the newly reformed 8th Army. They were supported by a large quantity of aircraft and the superior British Navy. However, the British forces' overextension meant that they were unprepared for the concentrated Axis assault. Despite Rommel's orders to take a defensive stance until more reinforcements arrived in May of 1941, the ambitious commander took action after remarkably easy early offensive victories at Al Aguila and Mursa Brega. Before long, he put the German plans for Operation Sonnenblume, or Sunflower, into action early. Our historian friend from the last episode, Stephen W. Sears, notes that, "...the army that faced Rommel was not the fast-moving, quick-thinking force that had chased Marshal Graziani out of Egypt. The Desert Rats of the 7th Armored Division had been replaced by the newly arrived 2nd Armored Division, and the 6th Australian Division was relieved by another Australian Division, untrained and poor." equipped. Like O'Connor did before him, Rommel split his forces in an attempt to cut the enemy off, ordering some troops to take the coastal route and ordering others to go through Serenaica. As for O'Connor himself, in an almost inconceivable blunder, the British officer's unescorted staff car took a wrong turn and drove right into Axis forces. He and his intended replacement, Philip Neem, along with John Coombe, the man who ambushed the retreating Italian army in 1940, were captured and Wavell was down three of his most experienced senior officers. By mid-April, Benghazi had fallen and nearly all of the British forces in Libya had been successfully pushed back to Egypt, with one notable exception, those at Tobruk. This fortified position was held by the remnants of the Australian 9th and 7th Divisions, along with several divisions of English and Commonwealth artillery who had fled there during Rommel's initial advance. One of the recurring themes in this series is the difficulty of keeping troops supplied in a huge desert battlefield like North Africa. 
To quote Stephen Sears once more, as Marshal Graziani had ruefully noted, Desert War imposed its own special rules. Rule number one was that armies brought with them everything they needed. There was no such thing as living off the country. Rommel would need Tobruk as a resupply port to have any chance of pushing into Egypt, thus began a seemingly endless siege of the isolated Allied position. Surrounded on three sides, the 23,000-manned garrison was assisted and supplied by the Royal Navy, but lacked air support, becoming the frequent target of Luftwaffe raids. The Germans and Italians sent wave after wave of troops against the Australians, but the defenses of Tobruk had been bolstered into a fortress. Royal engineers created a 30-mile semicircle of trenches and hardened defensive structures. Peppered in were lengths of barbed wire, tank traps, and landmines. Without the reinforcements, it seemed that Rommel would not be able to root out the troublesome Aussies on his flank and would have to be content with containing them. Spring saw numerous advances on either side that were quickly repelled. First among them was the aptly named Operation Brevity, which only lasted from May 15th to the 16th. British forces made slight gains that were nearly immediately undone by Axis counterattacks. Those incursions culminated with Axis forces seizing the choke point at Halfaya Pass on May 26th and the 27th, but were unable to move any further. As summer was nearing, Wavell received reinforcements as part of another operation, codenamed Tiger, a daring mission that saw 238 tanks ferried across the Mediterranean in relatively slow, vulnerable merchant ships protected by a Royal Navy escort. To be fair to Wavell, as supreme commander of all British forces in the Middle East, his troops had to contend not just with Rommel's Africa Corps, but also with the remaining Italians in East Africa, local rebellions in their oil-rich colonial holdings in Iraq, and the threat of Axis troops landing in Vichy French Syria and Lebanon. What's more, he was also responsible for overseeing the key Allied defensive positions in the Mediterranean, such as Crete and Malta. If the desert campaign really was the game of chess contemporary military strategists thought it was, Wavell was playing three games at once against three different opponents. On June 15th, Wavell launched Operation Battleaxe, a British and Indian offensive intended to push the German forces out of Halfaya Pass, with the ultimate goal of relieving Tobruk. And it proved no more successful than past attempts, and was called off after just two days. The frustrated Churchill relieved Wavell three weeks later and replaced him with the Commander-in-Chief of India, Claude the Auk Auchinleck, on July 5th. Sears notes, From the failure of Battleaxe, the British concluded that their tanks were outgunned by those of the enemy, when in most cases the actual killers were the anti-tank guns, particularly the 88 flag. The failure to appreciate the full value of the anti-tank gun was to haunt the British in months to come. The AUK spent the next few months resupplying and regrouping, while Rommel tried in vain to overwhelm the Australian garrison in Tobruk. The Aussies had no problem standing their ground, presumably because everything back home in Australia tries to kill you anyways. The Royal Navy continued to resupply them under the cover of darkness, and in September they were successfully rotated out of the city. Taking their place was the British 70th Division, the Polish Carpathian Brigade, and the Czechoslovak 11th Infantry Battalion. This mixed Allied force would hold the city for the rest of the siege. In November, British reinforcements joined with those from India, Sudan, South Africa, and New Zealand, swelling the AUK forces and prompting him to initiate Operation Crusader. By this point, the AUK had about 700 tanks, comprising Crusaders, Matildas, and the American lent leased tank, the Stuart. Rommel had just 390 tanks, mainly comprising Panzer III's and Panzer IV's. Despite what Battlefield V might tell you, there were no Tigers present in 1941. The operation which the AUK had placed under the command of Lieutenant General Alan Cunningham commenced on November 18th with a push into Salem and Bardia. While the British, South Africans, and Indians besieged the Axis forces there, the New Zealanders moved north to relieve Tobruk. On the 21st, a detachment of British and South African troops were dispatched to attack Sidi Rizieq, but were cut off and nearly destroyed when Rommel cut between those units in the north and the ones still fighting at Salem and Bardia. The New Zealanders did manage to reach Sidi Rizieq by November 25th and make contact with the garrison at Tobruk on the 30th. 
However, the units that were supposed to support them were so badly beaten that Cunningham urged the Auk to let them retreat. In response, Cunningham was fired and replaced with General Neil Ritchie. Truth be told, the British went through commanders so quickly that my artist couldn't keep up with drawing them, so here's a stick figure one of my writers drew. The New Zealanders, now experiencing heavy fighting on all sides, were ultimately unable to liberate Tobruk and withdrew back to Egypt on December 1st. However, as Rommel was never able to take Tobruk, he could only be resupplied from Tripoli, and even then only one-third of his intended materials survived the Royal Navy's interdictions. Once more, British forces had been consistently reinforced throughout the year, while the German campaign in Russia and the Balkans diverted any available Axis manpower away from North Africa. After a failed attempt to relieve the dangerously isolated Italian garrisons at Solom and Bardia, the Axis forces were forced to retreat as they were out of supplies, allowing the garrison at Tobruk to finally be liberated on the 10th after more than eight months of grueling siege. For additional reading or listening on the war in Africa, or any other historical topic including Rommel's own work, be sure to check out today's sponsor, Scribd. At only $8.99 a month, Scribd is cheaper than similar services. Over 100 million users actively use Scribd to read books, magazines, and listen to audiobooks on their computer, iOS, or Android devices, including us. Click the link in the description down below to support our channel and register for your 30-day trial. So what happened after Tobruk was finally liberated? Well, the Auk hoped to destroy Rommel's remaining forces by cutting them off at Beta Farm, as O'Connor and Wavell had done with the Italians the year before. Unfortunately, the Desert Fox slipped out of their grasp under the cover of darkness on Christmas Eve. Rommel officially began adapting to the harsh desert battlefield, and the next year would bring some of his greatest victories. Yet, the seeds of his destruction had already been sown. On December 11th, one day after the liberation of Tobruk, and four days after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Germany had declared war on the United States. A sleeping giant had awoken, and it threatened to put Axis plans to the torch. All that and more in our next episode.